We talked about doing an establishing shot of this chemical factory that's down the street. But I should probably mention, if you film that chemical factory, there's a good chance that FBI will contact you. I took a photo of it because I thought it looked interesting. And I got this little card from the FBI saying to call them. I thought it was because I order all these chemicals that I work with. And, you know, a lot of them are flammable. So I called the guy and I was just like, oh, well, uh, you know, I, I just moved into the area. I'm an artist and I thought it was interesting looking. And then he was like, oh, so you're, you're a photographer. And I was like, no, well, I'm not a photographer, but I... I thought it would make a nice photograph. And he's like, oh, so you thought it looked interesting as an artwork. I was like, yes, yes, that's, that's why. I've always been interested in material and then how it's represented in, in different abstract systems. Systems of administration or the law or technology. In the process, I realized that this relationship between abstract and materiality is embodied in chemistry. Artificial flavors are kind of a microcosm for the chemical paradigm of production that exists in society. My studio is in Commerce, California. It's very much like the prototypical industrial zone, which a lot of people see as a kind of dystopian backdrop. That's something that I always want to examine. Why is it that we see a swath of industrially utilized land and say that that's dystopian? This idea that things are dystopian if they are efficient. And the whole idea that things should be natural and not artificial is really holding people back. You have a population of soon to be 8 billion people in the world and not everyone can know the farmer that grows their tomatoes. Otherwise, every other person would have to grow tomatoes. I'm working on flavors and fragrances and the connection between a molecular structure and the sensory experience of that structure. I'm trying to bring culture to a point where it sees that a molecule is just a molecule, whether it's extracted from you know, an orange peel or whether it's added up in a quote unquote lab it's literally the same form of matter. Everything that I do is, is built up molecule by molecule. The primary consideration is the molecular shapes and their relationships to one another. The official title of, of all my formulations are always in what they call SMILES format, Simplified Molecular Input Line Entry System. All my formulations are sold per liter. As long as you have even a milliliter, of any of the formulations that I produce, then that's the artwork. That's a milliliter of the artwork. An early formulation, I called it phantom ringtone, and it was two molecules and one very minimal difference between the two experienced simultaneously. But what I was hoping to do by putting them together was to create this kind of confusion where your olfactory system is kind of fleeting between these two different perceptions. I see the artwork as only what's inside the container. To me, that's very important because most of the things in the mass economy, like crude oil or Coca-Cola, exist as liquids most of the time. Historically, the art economy has been predicated on its difference from the mass economy. So instead of something being valuable for being popular, it's valuable for being exclusive or singular, which limits the artist's influence in society. I think it's very important to try to push against that. A question that I get a lot is, is it an unlimited edition? And my only response is, well, is, is Coca-Cola an unlimited edition in that case? There's a belief in a kind of autonomy for the artist in the art economy that is, is actually very illusory. So I'm not thinking that, okay, this is limiting my autonomy as an artist. I'm thinking that this is actually opening up other avenues and considerations that I have to respond to. The olfactory sense, the sense of smell, has evolved to distinguish between different molecules. It's really at the point of olfaction that you can actually experience matter in a kind of unmediated way.
had read about Soylent. And what I thought was really interesting was here I was trying to break down flavors and fragrances into their basic forms of matter. And that's actually what they were doing with food in a kind of functional way. Since I started working with flavors and fragrances, my goal has always been to expand outside of the constraints of the art economy and try to mass manufacture some of these flavor formulations. So I approached them and they asked me to, to develop some prototypes. Technical food and technical milk were the first flavors that were manufactured on any sort of scale. The idea for that came about as kind of an abstraction of food and an abstraction of milk. The technical food is quite unusual, you could say. One thing that I'm really specifically trying to do is to reverse the paradigm of artificial flavors where it's a mimetic paradigm built on the idea of referencing nature, of referencing something external to the actual molecules that are present in the formula. So for example, rather than saying it's a strawberry flavor, you could say it's a furanial cis 3 hexanol ethyl formate flavor, and that would be more transparent. There's a term called food neophobia, and it basically means that people and animals in general are inherently suspicious of any sort of new flavor. And that's often something I have to work against. I'm trying to push outside of this more limited realm of possibility and kind of expand into the overall space where there's all sorts of other combinations of molecules that haven't ever been combined. The way the olfactory sense dovetails with the materiality of the world itself is really just incredible and as a being made of matter, what better way to experience one's own material existence than to encounter other kinds of material.